As we continue reviewing the evidence, I ask you to recall Dr. Melvin Morse, a pediatrician who has spent a considerable amount of time studying children who have had near-death experiences. And then inside, I found a honeybee as big as I was now. He has already stated in a previous program that NDEs could be evidence, although not proof, of life after death. Now when Dr. Moore discusses the function of the right temporal lobe, is he also talking about the reducing valve, referred to by Dr. Stanislav Grof? How can we explain all of these different kinds of experiences? Unless we start to understand that all of the clinical and experimental evidence clearly documents that these experiences are biological in nature. They are experiences which are at least linked to an area in our brain called our right temporal lobe. Now, I want to emphasize I'm being philosophically neutral in making that statement. I am not commenting on the objective reality uh, uh, that, you know, uh, is being described. I'm only saying that we cannot treat these experiences alone in isolation. We can't say the after death is a grief induced hallucination and the premonition of death is just some kind of weird thing that science doesn't even want to deal with and the shared dying experiences well, maybe some sort of cultural embellishment uh, by uh, patients who are acting out in grief and responding to too many Oprah Winfrey shows. Uh, you know, that uh, is not a theory which explains the evidence. One theory which does explain the evidence is the understanding that we have in our brains the biological ability to perceive another reality. Well documented. Both in experimental evidence and clinical evidence. And that area is our right temporal lobe. Arnold Mandel, the great neurobiologist, said it the best when he said the kingdom of heaven can be found in our right temporal lobes. Once we understand that simple fact, which has been documented in the, in the medical literature for over 80 years, you know, once our science and our spirituality start to get clear on that issue. Now we understand that, of course, in a wide variety of, of clinical situations, our right temporal lobes can activate to allow us to have this experience. The central argument for the spiritual nature of the NDE is the deep, often awe-inspiring effect it has had on many of the people who have experienced it. It's as if I have been lifted from the forest and shown the trees. So, again, it's per perspective. I'm no longer wandering in the, underneath the canopy, as it were. I now have a totally different vantage point. So, yes, I see things differently, but not because they are different. It's because I'm different. I had a very strong desire to meditate, to do yoga, to have a balanced lifestyle. And over the years, with the meditation, um, I had had a number of mystical, uh, visionary experiences. I think these experiences are very normal in people who've had a near-death experience, so I don't think that I'm exceptional or some great mystic or anything like that. I perceive myself as being a spiritual being after this accident who has a human experience. And my, my, my human, human experience is the garden for my soul. So the accident, in essence, was a gift. Of course, there are still debunkers. But what's particularly interesting about them is the way in which they couch their objections. Here's Dr. Susan Blackmore, perhaps the most scientifically rigorous of all such deniers. There's plenty of evidence that people do change after NDEs, but a lot of controversy about why. Most people will seem to think it's because they've actually met God or they've been to heaven and so on. I don't think so at all. I think the, the really transforming aspect of an NDE is when it goes far enough 
for the ordinary sense of self to start to dissolve. Now, our normal sense of self is, is an illusion, really. It's, there's a little me in there, controlling things, making the decisions in charge of my life, and all of that stuff. We live with this kind of illusion. As we get near death, or under extreme stress, or in very deep meditation, in other conditions too, that ordinary sense of self begins to break down. Near death, it's breaking down because the brain can't build it anymore. If you're a Buddhist meditator, it's breaking down be because the practice is leading it to break down. Either way, there comes a kind of awareness, consciousness, of things happening without me there in the middle. It can be a very profound sense of, I'm not important actually. Here's this world just going on doing its stuff. This is how it is. I'm not so important. And as the self even dissolves completely away, then there comes the classic mystical experience of oneness. There is no separate self, it's all one. The argument now has moved on to interpreting what it is that happened. And that's a huge step from where we were a couple of decades ago, when I, for example, first became aware of the question. A skeptic would say of the accounts of those who have had NDEs is that they prove nothing. I'd say that at the very least, it proves that the person involved has gone through an almost unbelievably profound change of consciousness, and it needs to be looked at very seriously. As we've tried to show in this series, there are other avenues of investigation beyond physical and personal testimony. For one, we've looked at the psychoanalytic approach, which opens up all kinds of new ideas about the possibility of life after death. Jung said the unconscious believes in a life after death. He and his followers collected and analyzed thousands upon thousands of dreams, and in the dreams of people who were near death, they found a flow of archetypal mythic images associated with impending death, a curtain coming down, a candle going out, and so on. Standard images, everywhere in the world, often religious in nature, which is not surprising. After all, we dream in the images we are familiar with. But this is the key point. In Jung's opinion, these images also showed a deep-seated unconscious belief that life somehow went on at the end of the physical person. Cory Beller died of leukemia at the age of nine, but the social worker he spoke to before his death remembers some of the remarkable dreams he had. He would cross a rainbow bridge in each dream and go to a place that was so pleasant and wonderful that he called it Summerland. And there was a crystal castle there. And increasingly, there were other children there that he knew from his cancer treatment. Um, these were kids who had died. He loved Summerland, and he spent more and more time in these dreams going there until he felt like his family was in an emotional position to accept his decision to go to Summerland permanently. So he said, hey, docs. I'm ready to die. I'm not going to have any more treatment. They said, okay. Send him home. And he died in his mother's arms on Mother's Day. Just because everyone in the world subconsciously believes in something doesn't necessarily make it true. But the thing to remember is that it doesn't make it false either. It seems to me that the human psyche uses greed ingenuity and richness of archetypal imagery to show a deep-seated belief that life somehow goes on even at its physical dissolution. The psyche is clearly not something that we can manipulate to produce this, and especially under extreme conditions like dying. And I find this evidence more powerful even than that of the near-death experience. In the course of this series, we have looked at other kinds of evidence, the experiences of dying children, who many people feel are closer to, to nature and to pure feeling. The teachings of the world's religions, which in all their diversity are united in the belief in some sort of afterlife. The evidence for and against reincarnation. There are mountains of testimony, of statistics, of argument. 
And yet in the long run, none of it really proves anything because we are dealing with the ineffable, with something we don't even know how to name, let alone how to describe convincingly. That something is happening. I feel that it's my responsibility as a doctor to share this awareness and this perspective with society because I think it's time that people were no longer automatically labeled as hallucinating or imagining things when they have a spiritual or paranormal experience. As Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, said, the peak experience of the numinous is the highest human experience. This is not a disease. It is not mental illness. And I feel it's important for me as a, as a doctor to speak up and say, this has happened to me. I've had a near-death experience. I've had a kundalini awakening. I've experienced a clairvoyant opening. I have had many spiritual and paranormal experiences. And I am a high-functioning, healthy person in today's society. For me personally, it's been a long, intellectually strenuous journey. I began it determined to follow the evidence wherever it led no matter what changes it might bring to my old beliefs. I, ex I examined the arguments of atheists, cynics, and skeptics as carefully as those of the most ardent believers. In the end, I'm fully persuaded that while there's no proof, the evidence in favor of survival beyond the grave vastly outweighs the evidence against it. Today, I believe in life after death more strongly than ever before. Just what the next life will be like, nobody can say for sure. Some think it will be as part of some cosmic hole where the individual is swallowed up in an ocean of energy or peace. Some believe we keep coming back in successive lives until we're liberated from the cycle of rebirth. Each of you, of course, will make up your own mind. My own conclusion is that at death our true selves move on to another dimension of existence in the presence of our loved ones and the reality we call God. Perhaps the NDE gives us helpful hints and guesses as to what that life will be like. I only know I agree both with St. Paul and Dr. Carl Jung. Human imagination can't begin to conjure up the wonderment of the journey that awaits us on the other side.